country in the south of Europe, stunningly beautiful from the tip of her toe to her alpine summits. Italy is packed full of natural wonders, secrets, and elemental forces. Always ready to surprise, and impossible to tame. After God had created the world, he had a few bits of rock left over. He threw them in the sea and stamped them into place. As decoration, he scattered over some of the best of everything. And that, according to ancient myth, was how Sardinia was created. The Mediterranean island really is a world of rocks and stones and geographically ancient, much older indeed than the rest of Italy. Huge canyons scar Sardinia, reminding us of its turbulent origins. The rocky earth doesn't yield much, so unique natural landscapes have been preserved. One of them is Jara di Gesturi, the plateau of a table mountain. Our most famous inhabitants are wild horses. They're the wild descendants of domestic animals, but their exact origins remain unclear. One theory claims they were brought to Sardinia by the Phoenicians in the 9th century BC. The four-legged landscape designers keep the meadow well trimmed grazing on the regrowing shrubbery. The foals grow up in the wild. No humans, and especially no stables, for miles around. They can easily find playmates as the horses live in small family groups, around 600 animals in total. The leading stallion keeps watch over the mares and herds his harem ever closer together. Close by, a muskrat family is trying to relax. People tend to be friendly up here, but for the rodents, that's no reason for the neighbours to get quite so close. When there's heavy rainfall, water gathers on the non-porous granite floor, a great attraction for many animals on this rather dry island. The horses also rely on the water. When it's hot, they have to drink over 50 litres a day. This young Eurasian coot is not being fed anymore by his parents and has to search for food himself. A rounded tail distinguishes the muskrat from the beaver with its flat tail. While beavers build their dens out of wood, muskrats make theirs from water vegetation. They have to attend to their fur on a regular basis. 
up to 16,000 hairs grow per square centimetre, 80 times as much as on a human head. The muskrat, who is in fact not a rat at all but a type of vole, has its origins in South America. In the meantime, however, they're at home almost all over Europe. The horses from the plateau feed to a large extent on plants, which they graze on under the water. Muskrats are also strict vegetarians, while the storks prefer the abundance of frogs. The Jara horses are unique to Sardinia. They don't exist anywhere else in the world. The foals stick with their mothers for about a year. In the past, they would then start helping the farmers in the fields. In the era of modern machinery, however, they can now spend the whole year romping around the Jara digestory. Sardinia was formed half a billion years ago, and even today, three quarters of the island is still made up of stones from that period. Thanks to a varied landscape, which combines many elements, Sardinia is also known as the Little Continent. Grassy landscapes dominate the lower regions, an ideal habitat for the stone curlew. He always prefers to have everything within sight. The stone curlew is about the size of a chicken. His partner has left the nest and wants to be replaced. The eggs are very well concealed. A brief greeting ritual helps to reinforce their relationship, which they enter into for the season. The curlew is always vigilant to make sure that no enemy is lurking nearby. No one should know where the eggs are hidden. Both birds take turns in brooding over the eggs, from which, in around four weeks, the young will hatch. With around 65 inhabitants per square kilometre, Sardinia is sparsely populated. Many coastal areas especially are hardly occupied. Wild boar are happy to inhabit the free territory. They can multiply virtually unimpeded thanks to the absence of larger predators on the island. A few sows supervise the kindergarten. Offspring are born almost simultaneously in undisturbed droves. They start young with digging practice. The boars don't often clash with the Sardinians over their gardening habits, thanks to the huge amount of free land. Parts of Sardinia and extensive areas of the southern Italian mainland were formed from limestone 200,000 million years ago. Back then, the original Mediterranean Sea still reached the Alps. 
Over millions of years, the rain has trickled through the porous karst and formed vast cavities. Thanks to the limestone, Italy has an underground network of thousands of caves, a fascinating subterranean kingdom hardly known about until relatively recently. One of the largest limestone caves in the world is the Grotte di Frassassi, almost 30 kilometers long and up to 240 meters high. Only in 1971 did a human being first set foot inside. The underground wonder world is based on a chemical reaction. The rainwater extracts carbon dioxide from the air and then releases calcium salts when it trickles away. Limestone is then deposited in the cave, in drops on the floor or by dripping down from the ceiling. As the deposits grow and join, a pillar eventually forms. Inside the caves, it's normally pitch black, and some creatures have perfectly adapted to it. Bats. More bats live underneath Italy than almost anywhere else in Europe. Mehili's horseshoe bat, for instance, or Felton's myotis. Some of them form enormous colonies of several thousand. Towards evening, they set off gradually to hunt. During their expeditions, they constantly emit ultrasound signals, taking their bearings perfectly from the echoes. Only at dawn will they return to the cave. Right in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean lies its largest island, Sicily. Etna, the highest and most active volcano in Europe, has been feared and worshipped by humans since ancient times. Over 2,500 years ago, the Greeks were already building imposing structures on Sicily. The remains of some of them are still well preserved. One example is Selenunte, a once flourishing city on the south coast with eight temples. It was destroyed by the Carthaginians in 409 BC, then rebuilt by the Syracusans. It was said to be finally demolished 1,500 years ago by a major earthquake. For small reptiles like the common wall gecko, the ruins are a perfect home. Not only do they offer countless hiding places, but also ideal sun decks. A lot of building work still goes on in the temples today, albeit on a smaller scale. Mason bees build new breeding cells from a pulp of sediment and saliva. The wild bees fill the cells with pollen and nectar, then finally lay their eggs inside. The larvae then hatch in the middle of the well-stocked food store. But the bees' plans don't always work out. The Sicilian wall lizard knows exactly how to get to the calorie cocktail.
The lizards and the bees are in constant competition. Will the insects manage to gather enough pollen, then quickly lay their eggs and close the cell? Or will the lizard be faster this time? La Primavera Siciliana is not only famous in Italy. The volcanic earth is fertile, and every year in spring, the island is decorated with a multitude of flowers. While the north is still in bloom, the Sicilian sun has withered everything in the south. The rollers have just returned from their wintering regions in southern Africa. They're already starting with their family planning. The male wants to make a good impression, so hands over a wedding gift, an insect, apparently a favourite souvenir of the rollers. Not every catch reaches the special someone. He also has to keep up his strength. But to really convince her, a present alone is not enough. The chemistry between them appears to be working. The foundation for a summer together has been established. The couple will soon start mating and then later care for the offspring together. Originally, Sicily was heavily forested, but most trees have been cut down over the centuries for shipbuilding and land gain. In many cleared areas, maquis shrubland has developed, a feature of the Mediterranean region. Its main users are goats. Goat grazing is widespread in Sicily and has left its mark on the land in many places. In contrast to sheep, goats can feed for the most part on foliage and branches. The puppy looks rather sceptical at the sight of his future charges. The shepherd Leonardo has a lot to teach him. Few Sicilians still live only from keeping goats. The animals are landscape conservationists, preventing uncontrolled growth by their constant grazing. The goats have no need to fear the leopard snake. It's neither poisonous nor on the lookout for prey. It's an accomplished climber, however. The red-backed shrike had better watch out. The snake detects the scent of the bird on its tongue. but the bird won't let itself be caught that easily. Three quarters of the land on Sicily is used. Unlike on the coast, however, intensive agriculture is not worthwhile in the dry inland areas. Arable land like this is occupied by animals like the collared pratin coal. The African steppe bird doesn't breed in southern Europe often, but then Africa is just 150 kilometers away from Sicily.
The birds are nervous. They've detected some lesser kestrels. In order to distract the kestrels, they decide to leave the nest. Their eggs are hard to spot on the farmland. According to scientists, the diet of the lesser kestrel is 90% insect-based. For the collared Pratton coal, however, it's a bit too risky. A wise decision. As this kestrel demonstrates, it really is only 90% insects. The kestrel's destination is an abandoned farm. The grey head distinguishes the male from the female. The portable prey gives it away. The kestrel has offspring to care for. These sociable birds breed in colonies, and the old house offers the rock lovers outstanding nesting places. Some of the chicks are almost fully fledged, while others still have their downy plumage. Many a youngster is already taking considerable risks. The rollers have also found shelter here. Otherwise, they breed in tree holes or rock cavities. Not far away, some farmers are burning a harvested field in order to improve the soil quality. As if on command, the squatters make a move. Mice, reptiles and insects flushed out by the fire offer them plenty of food. The kestrels seek out their prey from the air, quite a feat in those fumes. Storks lurk at the edge of the field for animals fleeing the fire. The lesser kestrels profit from the non-industrialised agriculture. In the mid-1990s, there were fewer than 5,000 of them. One reason was pesticide use. Gradually, they're becoming more common again, especially in Italy. Things are also going better again for the rollers. Forty kilometres north of Sicily, the most easterly of the seven Aeolian islands towers out of the sea. Stromboli. The volcano, which bears the same name as the island, is constantly active and routinely brings the surrounding sea to the boil. The volcanic cone reaches up to 3,000 metres from the sea floor, 
Even in ancient times, this torch of the ocean was guiding seafarers on their way. Eruptions occur virtually every minute. With bigger eruptions, the lava can flow into the sea, until now only down an uninhabited slope. Nevertheless, the island has been evacuated several times before. Under the ocean bed off the coast of Sicily, two continents collide. The 30 kilometer thick African plate slides under the European. This results in impacts and fractures, which frequently cause the seabed to tremble. At any time, the seams can burst open, spewing out magma from Stromboli through to Etna. The island volcanoes make it impressively clear that our planet is continuing to change its form, slowly but surely. The future of Italy depends, in the truest sense, on its underground movements. The first fishermen set off when it's still night time. Pepe has been heading out to sea for over 30 years. In a few more, his son is to take over the boat. The majority of fishermen in southern Italy work on a small scale for sale to markets and restaurants. The sea has not made Pepe and his son rich. They live very modestly. The only chance to preserve the often completely overfished stocks of the Mediterranean is to focus exclusively on sustainable fishing. still seems to be well in the underwater world off the coast of Sardinia. It counts, as ever, among the most beautiful spots for diving. The ray's flat body offers a hint to where he prefers to hang out, near the ground, where he's well camouflaged. With his mouth underneath, he catches mussels, crabs, and snails. The fried egg jellyfish has an umbrella of up to 40 centimeters in diameter and can actually swim. Sea snails are rather less hectic. The gills are hidden in the finger-like extensions. With mollusks, the general rule is, the more colorful they are, the more poisonous an unmistakable warning to anyone who wants to reach out and touch. The variety of color and form seems to have no limits in the Mediterranean Ocean. The palette ranges from the delicate unicorn shrimp, ridding the Murray eel of parasites, via flounders involved in a border dispute, all the way to some real giants. The basking shark, at a length of up to 10 meters, is the second largest fish in the world and completely harmless. Despite his cavernous mouth, he feeds exclusively on plankton. The national park La Maddalena Arcipegalo was created, among others, off the Sardinian north coast in order to protect its natural resources.
the Supramonte, an imposing limestone massif, is also now a nature park. The inaccessible mountain range is sparsely populated and therefore an important retreat for animals. Whoever goes hiking here will certainly encounter half-wild domestic animals, especially pigs. Half-wild livestock farming is widespread on the island. It's not expensive, and the contented free-range pigs provide excellent meat. They rummage around in the earth on a constant search for roots, tubers and acorns. Their sense of smell is excellent, and their noses can detect almost every treat, even underground. Antibiotics and cramped stalls are totally unknown to the piglets. Here on the natural meadows of the Supramonte, they can enjoy almost the same lifestyle as their wild ancestors. Pigs are omnivorous and will eat whatever appears in front of their noses. The domestic pigs are much more sensitive to heat than wild boars, however, and have to cool down in the midday sun. The siesta is suddenly interrupted. Sheep are also brought to pasture on the mountain meadows. The Genargentu National Park is also attached to the Supramonte, and it's even higher, harsher and lonelier. Here lies the kingdom of the Mouflin. The bucks are on the lookout for females. Rutting season is beginning. Most of the time, the does and their offspring live separately from the males. Only at rutting time do they tolerate the buck's proximity. The buck senses the doe's mood by sniffing her urine, causing him to flame. This transmits the scent molecules to a special olfactory organ in his gums. Every female will be checked. He's not the only one interested in the doors. Whoever has the thickest skull will have priority with the females later on. Mouflin used to live only on Sardinia and the neighbouring island of Corsica. 
From there, they were naturalized as game in virtually the whole of Europe, and even in the USA. When danger lurks, the mountain sheep flee between the rocks, where predators can hardly follow. On soft or even forest floors, they'd have practically no chance to escape, from wolves, for example. Autumn announces itself, and not only on Sardinia. Up in Abruzzo, the wild heart of Italy, summer is ending early. Here, the mountains soar to almost 3,000 metres. In the lower regions, vast beech forests are sprawled out. Here, autumn shows its true colours. Even today, it's a landscape custom-made for wild animals. In comparison to Sardinia, Sicily and many northern regions, Abruzzo is still an undiscovered piece of Italy. For centuries, humans have been taking advantage of the abundance of forests. In rough areas here, it's still worthwhile to work with horses. Luca was already a forest worker at the age of 14. That was more than 40 years ago. Today, he wants to head into the mountain forests with his horses to gather firewood. Winter is cold and long in Abruzzo, and modern central heating is rare in the small mountain villages. Working on the steep hillsides is dangerous. Luca has to train his horses well for this kind of work. By now, though, they know exactly how it works, and they bear their heavy loads with stoic serenity. A spiny toad feels rather exposed. The roof's just been taken from over his head. In autumn, these animals often seek shelter in wood piles. She pumps herself up powerfully. but doesn't seem to be impressing anyone. On their return journey, each horse carries up to 200 kilos of wood, sure-footed through the difficult terrain. Because it's such an old tradition, trees can still be felled, even in strictly protected areas of Abruzzo. However, the work has to be compatible with nature preservation to be allowed. Only those like Luca, who use horses instead of heavy machinery and only take as much wood as they need, are working sustainably. Before heading back up, Luca and his assistants have earned a break. Above the tree line, at a good 2,000 metres altitude, Abruzzo shows its rugged face. Chamois don't only live in the Alps. The Apennine chamois only exist here. 
they count as a unique species and are distinguishable from their northern relatives by a noticeably lighter coat. In Abruzzo, part of the chamois' habitat has been declared a national park, since there are only 1,800 of the mountain goats still left. Rutting has begun. For the bucks, it's all about establishing the hierarchy. They engage in daring chases in order to demonstrate their strength to the females. Chamois reach speeds of up to 50 kilometers an hour, quite a feat in the steep terrain. They can only manage all this because their lungs are larger than average, larger in fact than any other breed of goat. Their pulse rate is extremely high over long periods and they have a thickened heart wall, which allows them to sustain the effort. The buck with the most endurance has the right to the females. However, the race is far from won. The most difficult stage is still to come. The first brush off. Next try. Still no luck. Perhaps the more tolerant does are further down. Beating the male competitors in hill climbing is really only the start of a love story, which in some cases can take quite a while. Done it. In six months, the doe will give birth to her kid, usually only one. The buck lays down scent marks from glands behind his horns, thus announcing his claim to the territory and the females. He will also mate with others, as long as no competitor takes his place in the hierarchy. The winter comes quickly in Abruzzo. Frost has bewitched the landscape overnight. Winters here are long and hard. Snow will lie in the mountain tops for several months. Temperatures drop down to minus 15 degrees. Survival here requires a thick coat, which lynx have. The chilly season is not the worst for the big cat.
many weakened animals are caught more easily. Others fall victim to the cold. That's how the lynx can even get a fully grown deer hind. She'd be far too big as open quarry. Normally the cat could feed on her for several days. But she's not alone. A male has also smelt the goodies. Normally they'd get out of each other's way, but different rules apply in mating season. He's not letting her leave his sight. Now, however, there's no pussyfooting around the deer. Love is put on ice when it comes to food. Once the initial hunger is satisfied, the big cats hide the rest of their booty to return to later. Lynx had long since disappeared from Abruzzo and have only recently returned. There are still only very few of them around. They tiptoe back. At some point, spring will not be denied any longer in the mountains. The days will get longer, the sun warmer. Icy mountain water already ensures a lush, green valley. And when the cherry begins to blossom, winter is finally over. Bella Italia, from the rugged mountains to the Mediterranean Sea, still a country full of natural wonders and many surprises.